Hi, welcome to another Retronaut video. So this video has a loose attachment to the Fujitsu Ergo Pro X453 series that we've been working on, which is restoring um, a 1998 PC uh, back to working condition. And as a part of that video, I had to decide on what I was going to actually use to emulate the original hard drive. Uh, it's a spinning uh, metal IDE hard drive from the day. Uh, in good working condi condition, actually, it doesn't make any weird noises or anything like that. But I decided that it was a good idea to preserve that for other usage. So I'm going to actually replace that hard drive. Now, the question is, what do I replace it with? On the left of the table, I've got a bunch of different devices which are all IDE related. And over here, I've got some uh, SCSI related devices. This video in particular is actually about the SCSI devices. And I only ha actually have one of them. Um, I've used all three of them. Uh, well, I will d have done once I've used this one. Uh, but yeah, this video is about the, the Blue SCSI, which is a more recent uh, addition to the, the small family of uh, SCSI devices which are designed to work on retro systems. So I'll very quickly run through what the different options are. We'll get onto the Blue SCSI as quickly as possible. So one of the first emulation devices that we got was the Compact Flash 2 ID adapter. These are quite ubiquitous these days. They're very cheap. You can get different versions of them. For instance, this one has a hardwired female connection. You can also get them with male connections, which then allow you to attach them to the end of an ID cable if you want to actually get it remote from the socket. But this one goes into the socket like this. You then uh, put in a compact flash card like this into it, and off you go. It acts as if it was an actual ID hard drive. Another option is to use a, um, a micro SD, or rather, well, it's actually, you know, this was originally designed in the days when we had SD cards. Now we have micro SD cards, so this is an adapter. Um, that plugs into the, obviously, into the micro SD slot here, goes in there, and then it gives you an ID connection. You can see this is a male connection, so this is intended to connect to a cable. So this is literally like a an ID hard drive from back in the day. So that's another option and that has you know certain benefits and costs. And then the last thing in the IDE stable is, um, at least in this review, is uh, the um, SATA to ID adapter. Uh, you can get different sizes of them. This one is an example of a uh, two and a half inch drive uh, adapter and you can see they're both male. So these are both intended to go on cables. Um, here, there's the actual SATA adapter on this one for uh, the smaller sort of notebook size hard drives. And this is for um, obviously a three and a half inch drive. So again, this would be a sort of drop-in replacement for uh, an ID drive. And next we're gonna take a look at uh, the SCSI devices. So the first SCSI device which became available was the SD to SCSI. I'm not sure if that's way, the right way around, but basically that device uh, started the whole ball game in terms of emulating SCSI devices. These days they cost a certain amount of money, which I'll put up on screen. And I've actually got one of these. I've, I'm using one of these in one of my Apple Macintoshes. Works very well. Uh, you put a micro SD card into it and um, it's a really good uh, solution. The second option, which came out a little while later, was the Zulu SCSI. And again, a really good option. It's actually slightly more practical to use. But uh, these days I'm finding that they're actually rather expensive. So I've gone for the third option which has come out relatively recently, and that's called the uh, the Blue SCSI. So this is what the device looks like when it's put together. Not fully, it's actually missing the SCSI header here, which I'm still waiting uh, to be supplied by the, um, the vendor of this item. But this is partially assembled by myself, and it was supplied partially assembled by the vendor, which means it's a relatively simple project to do if you're um, into sort of doing that kind of thing. Uh, in this case, it was actually the Raspberry Pi Pico, which is used here. That does the heavy lifting for this particular project. Um, you also have to attach these headers, which are supplied in this kit. Um, you have to attach the 50 pin header. Obviously that's to connect up the SCSI cable. And then there's a connector here for floppy power. And that's for if the bus here doesn't supply enough power to drive this card. A lot of the vendors, they, um, these designs, they use a, a trick where they basically get the termination power from the SCSI bus to try and then power the card. 
And I found that with a SD to SCSI card, that actually worked for me. Um, I guess there might be certain circumstances where that doesn't work, and in which case then you're meant to supply power uh, using the header over here, the power header. So yeah, that's this is um, basically a replacement for an internal hard drive. Uh, that's why it's got this bracket on it, which was supplied in the kit. And I'm hoping that this will work and be the fastest device in my machine because I've installed an Adaptex SCSI card into that machine, the, the Ergo Pro. I haven't actually done those benchmarks yet because I can't. Um, as you can see, the um, connector's not uh, there yet. So once this is fully assembled, I will then be putting this into the Ergo Pro and it will form part of a, a suite of tests that I'm going to do for the partner video to this one. So yeah, that's the uh, internal model of the Blue SCSI. And the main reason why this is a good device to think about these days is the cost and the fact that it performs really well. There actually were two versions of this card. There was the Blue SCSI one, which was uh, cheaper than the Zulu SCSI, but it didn't really perform as well. It had some issues with speed. Then the Blue SCSI version two came out. And if you have a look here, you'll see it's the version two model that I've got here. And that was basically fixed. So there aren't really any flies in the ointment these days with this uh, device. So I thought I'd give it a try. Um, as I said, I've already tried the SD to SCSI and I've also got the, the Zulu SCSI. So it'll be interesting to find out what this one actually uh, performs like. Another option, uh, which is quite exciting actually, I think, is, um, and this is one of the reasons why I got the SCSI card, is this is intended to be an external uh, SCSI device. Obviously a lot smaller than the other one. Um, actually cheaper. Um, so yeah, I mean, you don't really want to have a SCSI device hanging at the back of your machine, but it's, I suppose if it's in a safe position, you could just use this model, not even put a case on it. Um, but the vendor did actually sell a case, um, and I've taken the liberty of spraying this one silver just for the fun of it, because it's actually a matte gray, uh, you know, 3D printed matte gray. This obviously uh, fits in here. I did find it was a bit too tight to actually fit, so I've, I've used a scalpel to cut out some of the plastic to make it fit a little bit better. It now goes in there really snugly, and uh, obviously that goes on top. Um, and that gives you quite an attractive looking device, which we'll look at, you know, at the end of this video when we put it all together. And it's got two ports on it on the left and right hand side, and that's to allow you to put the uh, micro SD card in, uh, in, which goes in there. It's in a very sort of skewered hidden position inside, underneath the Pico. Um, and then on this side, you've got the, um, the USB uh, connector. I'm not sure, to be honest, quite yet, uh, what's that needed for. I think it was actually for flashing the firmware. But yeah, we'll have to find out when we use this device exactly uh, where that comes into play. So you obviously need to have access to it because he's left um, the ports there. Yeah, so let's just put this together, show you what it looks like. Okay, so that's the case. So yeah, when it's in there, it's going to be quite nice. Um, and he supplied a little uh, blue SCSI sticker as well, which I'm going to put on the other side. So yeah, this will actually connect to an external uh, SCSI connector on a PC or obviously an Apple Macintosh or an Amiga actually. Um, so it's a really cool device to have because you should be able to swap the micro SD card in and out of here. And then you can actually use this device to store different operating systems for different platforms. It can be an Amiga drive, it can be a PC drive, it can be a Macintosh drive, or you know, it can work on any other system really where SCSI was a thing. So yeah, really cool device this, definitely worth trying out. Now, when I received both of these items, the internal item and uh, the external, as I said, they were a kit, and I'm going to show you these on screen now. For the board here, you can actually get these manufactured at a company like, for instance, PCBWay. That's not an advert, it's just an example. And then you could obviously buy all the chips and then you could populate everything on here yourself. That's obviously the cheapest option. But the problem with that is obviously you have to source all the chips, uh, which are very specific, and then um, obviously then solder them on. And if you look at the pitch at some of the chips on here, it's quite tiny. So what this particular vendor's uh, done is, um, I think he might have got them already pre-assembled or he's actually done them themselves. I'm not quite sure, to be honest. But the uh, Pico board itself comes unattached with the, it's got the actual headers there. So we're gonna show you that in a second, how I put that together. This is the first time I've done anything like this, really actually putting boards together. So that's quite fun for me, hopefully, You'll enjoy my um, flounderings as I try to put it back together. You know, I put the headers on and I put the Pico on. And obviously once the uh, SCSI uh, connector comes, I'll put that on and obviously the floppy connector. The external board was a lot simpler. For that one, I had to do the Pico as well. Also had to do this connector here and it came out pretty good actually. So again, I'm gonna show you how that goes so let's do that now. Let's uh, go on and see how I put this together. You can see it came up pretty good, but let's see what actually happened when I actually tried to assemble these items.
Hey, so um, what we're going to do now is we're going to solder this together. And uh, this is a Blue SCSI internal drive board. It comes with um, a Pico. I got this as a kit. And I'm also putting together uh, an external uh, Blue SCSI as well. Um, I've got the parts here. This one does actually have the external connector, uh, which you can see there. So this can actually go together. And I've also got the Pico for this as well. And this one, I don't think it has any jumpers as far as I can see. Well, it's got one here for three, um, but I've not had anything supplied. So I'm assuming that that's not really need needed that much. It's quite a nice little kit. Um, I also paid for a 3D printed case. Uh, there you can see. And um, vendor also sent me some blue SCSI stickers. So I'm not quite sure if that's a completely transparent one, if it's white, um, but that actually might go on the case. I've actually already uh, soldered one of these. And that's because I had some issues yesterday with the camera. I was recording and, um, you know, I'm actually not that experienced with soldering. So I was learning as, as I was going along and um, it was all going really well. And then all of a sudden I noticed that the, uh, the camera had actually stopped recording. So unfortunately, I, it wasn't so much that I lost the footage. It's just that I stopped, you know, the footage stopped halfway through and obviously, I, you know, that can't be used really. What we're going to do here is we're going to actually going to solder the other one. I learned quite a bit yesterday. I started using this new soldering gun. Uh, it's a nation, uh, soldering station. And it's the first time I've used a cartridge based, um, solder station, uh, and soldering thing. And what that means is you can actually take the tips off. Um, they're actually just press fit in, which is really cool. Obviously you don't want to do that when it's on, obviously, but there's, um, you know, the little stand that you put the soldering iron in that actually has uh, little, uh, ruts where you can put the tip in and then pull and actually pull the tip off and then push another one of these on, uh, whilst you're working, which is really cool. These are the generic ones that actually came with the solder station because it's a it's sort of sort of a cheap station. But apparently, if you buy the uh, the brands that originated this style, you get very very good results. And I must admit, yesterday when I tried this uh, soldering iron, um, I found it much easier to solder this. Once I got a technique worked out, I pretty much soldered this in about. I think I would have done it in about a minute or something. It was kind of crazy actually. Um, so let's see if I can repeat that uh, level of fluidity now. I'm gonna put the uh, iron back in its stand and turn it on. You'll hear a noise as it turns on. And I'm gonna put it up to um, 400. I can see it smoking away. And whilst that's heating up, which actually takes just a few seconds, um, I'm gonna use this chip quick Flux, and this is also a new product, uh, surprisingly expensive, I found, uh, 30 pounds uh, for a tube of this. Uh, I think this is 30 cc, so it's quite a big tube, to be honest. Um, but you do have to slather this on. Um, it's a little bit annoying because this syringe, the plunger, doesn't actually clip in or something, so it just keeps on falling out, which is a bit annoying. So anyway, let's not carry on moaning and get on with it. So I'm just going to put some flux on each of these pins. Let's just make sure I've got this the right way around, actually. Let me just check this first. Uh, it's going to be quite proud like this when it's finished, because uh, the um, what it is, the bracket underneath stops these pins going any further. And I'll obviously I'll have to remove this from this bracket um, to solder on the, the Pico when it's ready. So anyway, back to doing the flux. Let's just get this done. Yeah, a decent blob on each pin. I found yesterday that once you get a decent blob and what I was doing was I was actually heating up the uh, solder onto the iron to create a blob on the iron. And then I was presenting it to the pin and I found that when you have flux on it, it just sucks into the pin and solders almost instantly, which is great. So that's the technique I was using. And when I use that technique, I can actually solder each pin, as I said, in just a few seconds rather than waiting for the pin to heat up. Yeah, you just basically get this molten solder on the iron and then you just present it to the pin and in it goes. So we are just putting a decent smothering of uh, flux on each pin here. And I'm gonna do the usual technique what people use, which is to solder one corner first to get it pinned. So like I said, I'm going to put the solder onto the iron, onto the tip here. And then I can I'm gonna present it to the pin like that. We'll see if that works. I'm going to do this side. Unfortunately, that does face away from the camera. It's obviously very mm -hmm. awkward to do soldering and uh, film it at the same time. So I've got some solder on there. Done. Solder on there. 
done. Solder on there. Not enough. A bit more. And this one's been a bit awkward. Done. Yeah, you see how good it is? Um, one note I've got to make is that I really do have to get a ventilation fan for this. Because you can see the amount of vapor I'm getting here. It's not nice. Um, so on we go. This is just a revelation of a technique. It's so quick. There we are. On we go. Obviously practice makes perfect. And as I go along, I'm assuming that I'll get better at this. Yeah, I mean, I've had a cheap soldering iron for a couple of years now. You know what it's like with a hobby. You don't want to really start with expensive equipment. You want to just try it out and, you know, do you even enjoy it at all? And if you do, then obviously over time you can then get a little bit more serious and uh, level up, get more expensive equipment. And I think that's every pin soldered on that side. Let's turn it around. Yeah, it's relatively neat. I'm not going to win any uh, awards for my soldering, let's face it. Um, I'm relatively new to the whole thing, so... But, you know, I think the most important thing is that it's... Uh, straight and um, sturdy, you know, and uh, this is going in well, you know, I'm seeing pretty good solder joints coming on here. Obviously, when I turn it around and solder in the other side, that'll be interesting to see if this technique works just as well. But yeah, this was great last night when I learned that uh, you could use this technique. The other technique that you can do is where you basically put the solder iron against the pin you wait for the pin to heat up and then you um, then you present the solder. But the problem with that technique is it just wastes so much energy just heating the pin up, I think. Uh, whereas here you rely on the, uh, the flux and the heat of the molten solder to transmit the heat almost instantly, which is great. Yeah, I don't know if it's the solder or the, uh, the flux, what's actually the biggest contributor to, you know, this working so well. Um, I'm going to assume it's the flux. Yeah, it's good stuff. One more after this. I think that was pretty fast. Right, I'm just going to clean off the tip. There we are. Just make sure that's nice and clean. Let's try and get that into focus. Yeah, that's relatively clean. Let's take this out of here. And uh, obviously at the end of this, I need to clean off all the flux. I need to take this out of the board now, and then uh, we'll try and uh, solder this on. One thing I've got to make sure about is obviously the uh, orientation of this board. So let me just check online what that should be, and we'll get this soldered in. Okay, so I checked it, and the orientation is that uh, this USB jack should go towards the edge of the board. So uh, I think this is screwed in, so I'm just going to have to unscrew this. Hopefully this pops out easily enough. There we go. Right, so let's put that in. There we are, that's great. And, hmm, yes, I've just had a thought. The problem is, right, when this goes in, it's actually going to uh, not fit because uh, it needs to be proud. So I'm going to put the case back on. What I think we're going to have to do is we're going to have to tack this in position like this and then then I can take it off. So I basically need I need to do the, the, the four corners. I'm just going to put some flux in those corners. Okay, turning on the iron again. This one has an amazingly fast heat up time. So watch now. I turned it on. It's just powering up. It's going up in the temperatures and apparently it is now 400 degrees. I find it hard to believe that it's that quick but apparently it is. So I'm going to try the same technique. I'm going to put a little blob of solder on here and then I'm going to try and present it to this leg down here and hopefully it will just suck in. So hold it in position, turn it around. Yeah, that didn't work. Okay, let's try that again. Let's try putting a bit more solder on it this time. That's really messy, but I think it attached. That's the most important thing. Like I said, these are the tack. So I only really need probably two of these. So let's just try doing it on this one as well. I'm going to present it downwards. Yeah, there we go. That's pretty good. Right, let's clean that off. I'm just going to pop it out again. There we are. 
Okay, now we have to solder this side. This is the side. We've got easy access to the pins now. We're going to try using the same technique. So let's get the let's get the flux on. I am mindful of, you know, you are meant to use quite a lot of flux to do this, but at the same time, it's very expensive and I'm, it probably only needs a certain amount. And after that, it's all wasted, isn't it? Just vaporizing it. So I'm trying to apply it where it needs it, you know, right in the joint. There we are, that one's already done. So, and then I'm just going to do a quick wipe on this side, just to make sure it gets a smattering on this side. There we go. Same on this side. It'd be very interesting to see if this uh, knife tip works in the same way as it did on the other side. Fingers crossed, because if it does, it's an amazing technique. It's very quick. Okay, so I'd like this to be held a bit more. So I'm just going to put a screwdriver under here to stop it rocking. And let's try it. Okay, and present. Wow, that works really well. Just get sucked straight in. It'd be nice in the future if I can work out how to get a camera so I can film what I see. Uh, tell you what would allow you to do that, I suppose, would be like a Vision Pro, wouldn't it? The new Apple device. The only problem with that is, how would you wear jewels goggles on top? That'd be quite funny. Already looks a bit silly anyway. You just have to make sure there's a decent bubble of solder on the knife edge. And you just present it, give it a second to heat up, and in it goes. Remarkable. Of course, I'm assuming this is correct, you know? Hopefully when we check this, we'll find that this is all good. That looks great. Over to the other side. So yeah, um, the 50 pin connector has been ordered, um, the, you know, the one that should have come. So hopefully that will be here. Uh, it's not going to be here today, maybe not here tomorrow. So hopefully by the weekend, uh, it's actually Thursday today. Uh, so I'm hoping the vendors realize their boo-boo and is uh, going to fix that pretty quickly. Just using a bit of a jiggle on it, actually, just to agitate it in. There we are. Definitely need a ventilator, though. Some kind of ventilation. I wonder if this solder actually has some flux in it. That's it. Okay, let's clean off the blade on this uh, soldering iron. Get the knife edge of it nice and clean again. Yeah, that looks pretty good, I think. Put it back in the station, turn the station off for safety. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and get a little bit of blue tack. I've got all of the headers here, and I found a picture online of what it should all look like, and I'm going to try and solder these in as well. That will be done for now because I don't have the, the connector for here or the floppy connector, so I'm just going to have to wait for that to turn up. So yeah, let's, let me just do a quick check online, and uh, I'll come back and I'll solder in the headers. I'll get them ready with some blue tack. Okay, so I checked online and I found out where all the jumpers are meant to go and here they are in position. And you can see that I've taken a tip out of Mark Fix's Stuff's uh, book of tricks and I've used um, little blobs of the Wonder Stuff, otherwise known as blue tack. Now, I'm a little bit worried because a lot of the blue tack's actually touching the pins and I don't want it to get burnt. But hopefully because of the technique that I just showed you where we put on some flux and then we get the solder ready and then we apply it quite quickly, I'm not going to heat up these pins to an incredibly high temperature. Hopefully it's going to be pretty quick and most of the heat is going to be localized to the, um, the area that we're going to solder. And that area is here. So this isn't going to be too exciting. I'm just going to put on the flux where the headers are. Uh, so here. Now you can see I've not actually populated all the headers. Um, and that's because some of them just didn't seem to be needed. I've seen people using this and they're not actually populated. If they are needed, then I'll have to get more because the uh, the kit that I got didn't really supply any more. 
Um, so I've used up all the ones that were supplied to me. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a sort of large electronic stash where I have extras. So this is it for now. You know, I've gone for basically populating the headers, which I think are actually needed. Time will tell if that's actually correct. I think it's all good. Right. Right then. So I'm going to go side on with these. There we go. Straight in and... Just the last three. That's how quick it is. Amazing. That's it. The headers are on. I should now be able to take off the blue tack, which has not burned. Lives to fight another day. Or tack another day, I should say. Doesn't really fight, does it? It's a lover, not a fighter. Okay, wonderful. Look at that. All I need to do now is um, clean that with some alcohol and it's ready to go, apart from obviously the scuzzy header and the floppy. So for now, this is done. Obviously, we just need to wait for those parts to turn up. We can continue this and finish it. So I'm going to just put that to the side. I'm not going to put it... Well, actually, let me just put it back in here for now, for safekeeping. I'm just going to put this screw back in, just so I don't lose it. Put that to the side. Now for the external. Obviously, I need to solder that in. So I think first we'll go for... We'll go for this, I think. We'll go for the uh, connector. So there's only one way this can go, really, so which is good. No confusion. Not done one of these before. This will be my first time doing this kind of thing. Needs a lot of solder in here. Um, and then these are just normal pins. So first we need to get the flux in there. And uh, I don't really want to put any flux on here because I think, well, maybe a little bit on here, but I can't fill the hole. It'd just be such a waste. So on here, Actually, this is working better while I kind of wrap it around each one. Almost like a kind of knitting technique. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, let's do the same again, because I didn't really think I had enough on here. Yeah, so you can see that I'm sort of using a string of it to go between each one. And I think what I'll do is I'll get the, um, get the Pico ready as well. Okay, so I've checked online, and the orientation for this is in this direction. So let's just try and get this in. This is okay, right? This fell off a bit, so let me just get that right. This looks nice and sturdy. So we need to pin, pin this to stop it moving. So I'm just gonna go for here and here, just the corners for now. Just make sure that's on nicely. Yeah, that's on nicely as well. So let's first try and pin this in. And in this case, I don't think, you know, let's hold this here for a second. Just trying to build up a massive blob here. Wow, that was great. Did you see that? I'm just basically trying to fill in this hole. Yeah, where'd that go? There we are. Just a bit more. Wonderful. It didn't go so good. Not a flux on that. And that's it. And uh, we've already done this, haven't we? And we're ready to solder. Let's see, how am I gonna do this? Uh, like this, I think. That's it, I think that's ready to go. Obviously I'll have to check the continuity of everything afterwards, but it's basically done. Just clean the solder head, it's got a bit dirty. Oxidation, here we are. 
so yeah, I think basically that's looking pretty good. I've gone through all the other pins and uh, I've checked for continuity. Well, actually I need to check for continuity, sorry. Um, that's the last stage, make sure this all connected up correctly. But the soldering all looks pretty good um, in the sense that, you know, everything looks like it's connected and it's pretty robust, I think. Obviously this needs to go in its case when I make sure it's all working. And then we need to test it out with a micro SD card um, and actually see if that's actually, you know, functional. And uh, what we'll be doing in the rest of this video is we'll be testing this out and seeing if this works, you know, as expected. So yeah, I'm just going to clean the tip on my soldering iron and um, we'll just uh, go on to the next stage of this project. So it's a couple of days later and finally the connector turned up uh, for the SCSI, uh, the 50 pin right angle connector and also the floppy uh, connector here, which is used for power. I've already held these on with blue tack. Uh, just to aid this process. So what I'm going to do now is very quickly uh, get these with flux so we can solder those pretty quickly. Right, let's get the soldering station turned on. Okay, so the soldering iron is turned on. It's set to 400, just like the other day. So I'm just going to now hopefully solder this up pretty quickly. Yeah, I can feel it's pretty hot. There we go, there's a blob, big blob of solder. There we are. Now I'm gonna try and put a little bit more solder on these because these are uh, load bearing connections here. There we are. Because this is a power connector and I know these take a lot of stress when you use them. That's good. Just going to clean the iron. Make sure I get any oxidized solder off. Okay, let's see if we can go through these a bit faster. Because these are smaller, the load is obviously spread out of a lot more pins. Let's turn around. Just give that a bit more <coughs> flux. They're just looking a bit dry. I'm pretty sure I did them, but maybe it's just drained away. Okay. Okay. Let's have a quick look at this. Just clean that off and I'll just make sure this is all good. I think it's good. So what I'm going to do now is just quickly check with the uh, multimeter and make sure that all these pins are connected to something. Um, and then I think we're ready to go. Brilliant. So there we go. We managed to put together the two uh, Blue SCSI devices. Now, one of these has already actually been used in my Ergo Pro. It turned out in the end that I did actually want to use it in that machine and it was the full size uh, board which is basically a replacement for a full-size hard drive, which is an internal device. And that's actually, it's, our, it's already been used in that machine as a second drive. I did also, as you saw, put this together and uh, we're gonna actually look at it as a use case with this uh, setup here, which you might've seen in a previous video of mine. This is a SCSI based uh, hard drive. It's a GVP HD8 plus. And um, I've actually left the case loose so we can see that. So I'm just gonna take that off for you. There we go. Um, and this is actually a Zulu SCSI. And it's an important point to point out that the Zulu SCSI and the Blue SCSI, they, they share a lot of DNA and a lot of workflow actually. So most of the stuff that I'm gonna to explain to you now for the Blue SCSI V2 is actually pretty much applicable to the, uh, the Zulu SCSI. So bear that in mind. I've actually been using them pretty much interchangeably uh, when I was working on this project. So why, do, why am I showing you this? Well, because this um, sidecar for the Amiga 500 actually has an internal 50 pin uh, SCSI connector, but it also has a DB25 on the back uh, and that's a SCSI connector as well. And that means you can attach 
external SCSI devices. So we're actually going to try and do that now. Um, and when I actually went through this process, I found there are a few different things that I had to make sure of. So I'm going to explain that to you in this video. So hopefully that will help you to avoid the same pitfalls that I fell into when I was working on this. The first thing I would say is make sure that you update the firmware on these devices because I found that when I plugged this into the back of here, um, even when I fiddle around with different hard drive settings, it just didn't work. So what were the issues? Well, yeah, you have to update the firmware on this. This, I think the firmware when I got this was from last November, I think it was, uh, it just didn't work. So I updated the firmware and uh, that sorted out this device. That's one thing. Um, and you do that by basically downloading the firmware from the Blue SCSI uh, website and putting it onto the device. Um, and for that, you have to use a, um, I actually have one here. I think it's a micro USB connector. And uh, I got a bit of advice from the guy that actually makes Blue SCSI because I couldn't actually get that to work. And he advised me that, you know, some of these cables actually um, are only for power. You know, they're, de they're designed actually for say mobile devices and they don't actually supply data. So I had to dig around in my USB cable box and I found another one of these. Luckily, I only actually had two. And this one turned out to actually work. This is actually a data cable. Um, so I plugged that in um, and then I attached it to my PC and I transferred across the, the firmware file and then started up the device and it basically flashes itself and updates the firmware. So that's actually a pretty easy procedure to do once you actually have a working cable. Um, and this cable also came in uh, doubly useful as well because if you actually plug this in, and we'll do that now, I'm gonna plug that in here. Well, let me just put the case back on first, actually. I'll put the screws in later. Yeah, so when we actually plug this in, I'm gonna plug it into the back. There we go. It's in nice and firmly. So if I now turn on the machine, and I'll do that now, you'll see that when we look at the hard drive light on the front of the, the GVP device, it's on solid constantly. I thought that was a problem with possibly the um, files that I put onto the two different cards, if they were conflicting, so on and so forth. Um, and it turned out in the end that it wasn't that. It was also, this device actually requires for you to put external power into it in this particular scenario. It turns out that the power that is coming from the Amiga 500 is not enough to actually power it. So in goes the, the USB connector. And you'll see that when I do that, uh, a blue light comes on and that indicates that it's receiving power. And it actually, even without the Amiga turned on, the power from the USB is actually now powering the internal SCSI as well at the same time, which is interesting. Um, I guess it's all on the same bus and they, they seem to share the same power once you uh, powder that way. Now, if we turn on the uh, machine, We'll just have to wait for this to boot up because it's pretty slow. There we are, loaded up. And um, what's cool is now is we have an extra hard drive here. We have data. Um, these actual hard disks here, they're actually uh, on the internal uh, SCSI device. And I'm using, actually, I think it's um, three different devices. There are four. Yeah, three, three different devices, Workbench and Games A. They're both on hard drive zero. Uh, hard drive one is games B and um, hard drive two is game C. And if we have a look at game C, if we open it up, you'll see it's saying 3.8 gigabytes free. And I've basically gone for each device being uh, just under four gigabytes in size, uh, just to make sure it works perfectly fine with the Amiga DOS. Um, honestly, on an Amiga, that's a huge amount of space. So the fact that I've got several drives with that amount, with that amount of space on it is, um, is fantastic. I've already loaded some games onto Games A. Uh, this is for, for now the actual main drive where I'm putting games. Uh, but what I want to show you is um, actually transferring some data onto Game C, which I'll, I'll get rid of when I'm finished. Um, so now we're opening up the, um, the external drive on the back. And I've got a folder here called Strategy, and I'm going to copy that. And if you look at the hard drive now, you'll see that the, um, the light's blinking. And you'll actually see it on the back device. So as I move this over, you'll start copying away. You can see the, um, the actual uh, hard drive LEDs flashing on the actual external blue SCSI. If we look at the front of the machine, you'll also see the same light flashing. Um, it's actually pass through. 
So that's really fantastic. It doesn't really matter if it's an internal device or an external device. It all goes through the same bus. So you get those um, indications that the, uh, the data is being copied across. I've got to say it's not the fastest uh, experience in the world because you've got to realize this is a sort of like 1988 to 1991 SCSI device. It is not the faster SCSI 2. So at the best, you're going to get three megabytes a second. Uh, in reality, you probably get a lot less than that because right now the bus is being shared by copying and writing at the same time. But there we go. It's copied those games across. So that was nine megabytes basically um, of games. Uh, if you want it to be super fast, the best way to do this is actually to take the internal uh, SD card out and put it into an emulator like WinUAE and then actually copy the, the files um, on a Windows machine because it's very, very fast that way. And actually that's something which uh, brings me to a, an interesting point. How do we exactly do that? Well, in a previous video, uh, link up here, I go through the installation of this GVP uh, sidecar. And if you watch that video, you'll see I go through that process in detail. And obviously that's very specific to this Amiga with this particular sidecar, but the same approach can be followed with other SCSI cards which you have on the Amiga. Uh, GVP, for instance, also did these devices for Amiga 2000. So you could actually put in a Zorro card into an Amiga, uh, an Amiga 2000 and um, have a SCSI um, external DB25 like you have here and an internal uh, SCSI bus. But you can actually use the blue uh, SCSI with other machines. So let's have a quick look at that now. So we're just gonna have a quick look at the different emulators, which will allow you to work with blue SCSI. There are lots of them at this point on different platforms and to emulate different platforms. So the main ones I'm gonna look at here are, is WinUAE, which is as far as I understand it only on Windows right now. And that's for emulating Amigas. Then you have Basilisk 2, which I believe can be run on Windows and also on Mac OS. And that's for emulating retro Macintoshes up to the PowerPC Macintoshes. So if you want to go to the PowerPC Macintoshes, I think there's another emulator called Sheepshaver, which probably has a similar workflow, to be honest. So whatever applies to Basilisk will probably apply to Sheepshaver as well. Then you have 86box, which is a retro PC emulator. Pretty cool, actually. I only found about that recently. And um, that's something I'm planning to use with my retro SCSI devices. And then you have Disc Jockey, which isn't actually an emulator. That's why the title of the section is emulators and tools because it's actually a tool for working with disk images. I'll just give you a quick run over each one of these just to give you an idea of how you can use it with Blue SCSI. So you've got WinUAE and in the WinUAE user interface there is a section where it says CD and hard drives and in there you can specify a hard file and that actually is a disk image and those disk images are actually compatible with the hard files which you would have on the Mac in Basilisk 2 or in 86 box. It's basically the same file format. The only thing that tends to change you find is the file extension. Sometimes they're called .img, sometimes it's HDA. Yeah, it just depends really on the, the software. But what I found is that underneath it, the actual file remains the same. It's just the extensions that change. If you want to find out how to use Blue SCSI with WinUAE, uh, have a look at the link uh, shown up above. And that actually links to another video of ours, which I mentioned earlier, where we go through that in quite a lot of depth. So yeah, I won't dwell on that much here because you can see how to use it in that video. Next, we have Basilisk 2. Odd name, I'm not quite sure why it's called Basilisk 2. Something to do with stone being turned to stone. It is a retro Macintosh emulator. And you can see here we're on the volumes tab in it. And if you look at the top one there, it says Mac OS 8 image. It's an image again, and that image should be compatible with Blue SCSI. I'm sure that there are tutorials out there which show you how to use these images with Zulu SCSI, Blue SCSI, so on and so forth. But the basics is always the same. You create the image inside the emulator. You then name it so it makes sense for the emulator. If, if it insists, for instance, on .image, then you might have to name it that. Sometimes it actually allows you to use any file name, and then it will run inside the emulator you can then transfer the file onto the SD card or even run it directly from the SD card and then plug that into a real Mac and bomb, you've got your SCSI device and it's easily transferable between the virtual version of the machine and the actual physical version of the machine. Next, we've got 86box, a PC emulator, which I've only found out about recently, very similar to the other two in that it allows you to set up a PC in a pretty granular way. I suppose the big difference between a PC 
and the the Amiga and the Mac is that there were very many more ver variations on it. Obviously, it's a pretty much a Wild West in terms of specifications, chipsets. It has a bunch of ROMs built into it, which are the BIOSes for, for different machines. And I would assume that over time, those BIOSes will be extended. Then you obviously have the processors. You can see here, you can go all the way back to an 8088, um, 8086, 286, 386, 486, so on and so on. And if you look there on the left, you'll see you've got the storage controllers and the hard disks. Again, it uses images. So the same deal, you can create an image inside the software and then you can format it as a drive to run on, let's say, DOS. And I've actually done that for my Ergo Pro PC. And then you transfer those files onto the blue SCSI and it works. You, you end up with a SCSI device, which is exactly the same as the device which you've actually defined inside Windows. Very often these emulators will have a, a mode where you can actually run them much faster than a real machine will run, especially with in terms of hard disks. You can get them sometimes so that the hard disk effectively is a RAM disk and will load almost instantaneously anything. Uh, writing, pretty similar as well. Obviously, when you write that stuff to an actual SD card, not quite as fast, but you still get the massive speed improvement over a real machine of this era, you know, like a, running on a 286 or whatever. So you can basically copy software onto the hard drive on the emulated machine. And then when you're happy with that, you can then take out the SD card, plug it into your blue SCSI, and you'll have the same software on your actual real PC which is fantastic. Lastly, we've got Disc Jockey. As I said, this is a utility. It is very Mac-centric. I mean, if you look at the images, they're all different Macs. And if you look at the UI as well, you can see it's got a Mac top left, and it looks like it's of no use to anything other than the Mac community. In fact, it is, because you can just create images in here, and you can create images of different sizes. As you can see at the top, you can say, I want to have a 20 megabyte image, 30 megabyte image. Something to bear in mind with these images is that once they become gigabyte size, they can take a while to copy onto your SD back and forth. So it can be a good idea to actually create these images on your hard drive first, on your PC or on your Mac. And then once they're created, then transfer them onto your SD card. And in fact, most of the time you want to do that. You, you want to natively probably work with the image running on a modern hard drive. And then when you're finished with it and you're happy with what's actually on the hard drive, then copy that image onto the SD card. If you were to create, let's say, a 64 megabyte or 128 megabyte image, it can take quite a long time. It can take 10 minutes easily. If you do it on a hard drive, it can be much, much faster. And then obviously when you're finished with it and you then you want to actually transfer that data onto the SD card, again, it, it can take a while. Go make a coffee, have a cake, whatever it is that you like doing. When you come back, it'll be ready and you plug it into your Mac, you plug it into your Amiga, you plug it into your PC and you've got all that data. And it could be thousands of games, hundreds of games, you know, in 128 megabyte in the DOS era. Same thing on the Amiga and the Mac. We forget that these machines, it was very common for them to have quite small hard drives, really. You know, three gigabytes would have been a really big drive back in the day. Anyway, there we go. That's a little bit of an overview of these diff different platforms. And I hope that gives you an idea of how useful the Blue SCSI is, because you can use it on your Amiga, your Mac, and your PC with an adapter you can obviously then rock the external SCSI device experience as well. So yeah, it's outside of the scope really of this video to go into all the different machines. Each machine has its own setup, but I hopefully I've given you a few pointers there as to where you can sort of branch off and try using this device if you have a Mac or if you have a PC. I've already used the Blue SCSI V2 with a PC, so it, is, it definitely works. I know they definitely work on a Mac. In fact, the Blue SCSI is quite Mac-centric actually in its usage, and that's because Retro Max, um, they were all based on SCSI. They didn't have any ID whatsoever. So if you're going to have a Retro Macintosh, I'm talking like a Quadra or a Mac Classic or something like that, you're going to have to use something like a Blue SCSI or a Zulu SCSI or a SCSI 2SD inside that machine because you have no other option really. So it definitely does work. But like I said, it's completely outside of the, uh, the remit of this video to go into that into the kind of detail that you need to actually set it up. So yeah, hopefully, that's given you a good uh, indication of how you can get a blue SCSI on your machine. You can buy the kit or you can buy it fully made, save a little bit of money and have a bit of fun. If you enjoy doing soldering, obviously. If you don't enjoy soldering or it's just not something you're interested in doing, you can just pay a bit extra and get the blue SCSI put together. I'm actually trying to buff up my skills to work on a large project, which is going to come up in the future, which is an emulated machine. And it's that's going to be quite good fun, I think, when I get around to it. 
but I'm still practicing and I'm still learning as a sort of electronics person. So this machine was actually quite useful to do relatively small soldering. I mean, it wasn't that small, but you know, it was definitely something that helped me learn. I've never actually attached connectors like that. I've never sold it in a Raspberry Pi or anything like that. So I personally found it interesting to do that. Definitely a really good device. The Zulu SCSI is also a very good device as well. I prefer those two devices because they're, they're basically interchangeable. So if you can get your hands on a Zulu SCSI for less, if you can be, if somebody was to give you one, as it happened in my case, they're basically interchangeable with the Blue SCSI. They use the same system of using files to represent the, the hard drives. And those same files actually can be moved back and forth between the two devices. It's fantastic. So definitely a very good solution. What this, this gives me now is with this Amiga is I can actually plug in this external device with games copied onto it on my Amiga, which can be done quickly. And then I can basically drag and drop them into these folders and just leave it copying. Because on here, because it's a real SCSI bus, it's not gonna be super fast. But the actual SD card that I can take out of this external device and plug it in, into my Windows machine, that transfer is actually pretty quick. Um, so that's the plan with this machine. I don't want to keep on taking this external sidecar apart. I want to basically use it um, uh, and just add to it every now and again by using this external SCSI device. And it's going to be quite interesting as well, actually, to try and use this with my PC as well, my Ergo Pro, because that was also a plan on there. And in fact, I've actually got the gender changer, which I bought to use with this device, because on that machine, the external SCSI uh, connection isn't even a DB25, it's another SCSI connector. So it needed conversion from that connector to a DB25. And once I did that, it was then the wrong gender, hence the uh, gender changer. So I bought a couple of these just in case I ever need to get any more of these external devices, which I may actually do. So yeah, hopefully this video has been useful to you. And if it has, then please click on the like button because if you don't do that, it's not going to get uh, shared with other YouTube users. And if you like this video and you haven't been here before, please subscribe to the channel because we'd love to see you back in the future. Hopefully we'll be able to more, do more interesting videos like this for you. Sorry it was a little bit over long. You know, we tried to fit in quite a lot in this video. So thanks for sticking with us so far. And yeah, please do come back in the future and watch more of our videos. But until then, have a good day. Take care.